go ahead and grab your Bibles and turn them uh, to the, the Gospel of Mark, chapter 2, and we're going to continue. And actually, uh, today we'll be finishing up uh, chapter 2 uh, by looking at verses 23 to 28. And this morning's sermon is called uh, Free in Christ, Free in Christ. And so this really, uh, if you were in Sunday school this morning, this really kind of all runs together. That's going to be the theme of, of this morning for us. And I would say it's, it's quite a timely message uh, for us. And, and I know not everybody's like me, and, and I, I've been accused of, and probably rightly so, of, of being uh, Scrooge or Bah Humbug or, or whatever come uh, the holiday seasons because uh, I just get frustrated with all the running around and all the, I just feel so obligated sometimes that you have to be here, you have to be, go there, you have to eat this meal with this family member. You have to do all these things, and you wind up, you know, the whole intent of the season is to enjoy it and, and to, and to uh, you know, not to be miserable. And sometimes those burdens can be miserable and, and kind of mess things up. We can turn, uh, you know, something uh, you know, that's good into something uh, bad, you know. And so that's kind of what we're looking at here, you know, that, that, that God has, has given us the gift in this passage you'll see the, the gift of Sabbath, the, the gift of, of being able to rest and, and, to, and to be able to, to focus in on, on, on him and his word and, to, and to, to rest on and have a day set aside. And what you're going to see is the Pharisees have taken that and turned something good and, and turned it into something bad and where it has become something that's a burden and, and people are, are just are so concerned with, am I doing the right things? Am I, am I following the rules? Am I doing all these things or am I going to get in trouble? And so instead of resting on the, the, the Sabbath and worshiping, they were uh, stressed out to the max. And so, uh, you know, what we have, uh, you know, uh, for us, and we think about the holiday season is that it's similar. It's a similar thing that happens, and, and, and everybody has obligations, and, and, you know, every family's different. That Maybe you have traditions where uh, everybody goes to this house, or we go to this house, or if you're, uh, you know, if you're a, you're a married family, then you have to, you know, how can we visit this family and, and go to the in-laws' house? And then if you have uh, children and they're grown children, how can we get the grown children? And you understand what I'm saying? Y'all know what I'm talking about. Y'all all experience. Y'all all have to navigate these same waters. How can we make everybody happy? How, we, how can we get to everyone's house? How can we divide our times up and, and do all these things without losing our minds? And so that is the, the holiday seasons. That is the Christmas holiday that we have come to uh, you know, to both love and hate at the same time. And so the bottom line is nobody should be made to feel like you're a horrible person because you don't celebrate Christmas the same way that everybody else does, right? That there, there shouldn't be the, the same weight or this expectation on everyone to do things the same way. You see, believe it or not, there are no commandments from God regarding how we celebrate Christmas, and yet sometimes we act as if there are, right? That this is how it has to be. And that's just simply not true. And so there, there are some people that actually uh, go so far uh, as to be afflicted. They, they, they suffer through the holidays with anxiety and even panic attacks because of the pressure that has been placed on them because of these stipulations and all the things that they feel they have to do to stick with the family plan. And so that's, that's again, that's just a lead in to what uh, Jesus is going to be dealing with in our passage this morning. Right? Basically, the idea of taking something good and making it into something bad. That Jesus would just simply would not stick to the plan. We see this over and over again in the, these, these first two chapters of Mark's gospel. That he refused to be under the bondage of the rabbinical law of the Pharisees. That they had taken uh, what was good and right. They had taken God's law and they had turned it into something bad. That something that was burdensome towards the people. That the Pharisees were crushing the people with all their rules and all their rituals. And listen, if we're not careful, if we're not careful, we can find ourselves doing the same thing in our churches. The very same things. And so, what does it mean this morning? When I ask you the question, what does it mean to be free in Christ? Right? What does it mean to be free in Christ? And does it mean... Uh, that we're free to do whatever we want to do. Some people take that. They take that as, as liberty to be able to live like they want and, and, and even do things that that Bible would, uh, would say are sinful. Sinful things because they would say that uh, all of our sins have been forgiven, right? So what's the big deal if I sin, right? As Paul would say, absolutely not. 
May it not be so. The Apostle Paul dealt with this wrong way of thinking in Romans 6. In Romans 6, 1-4, he said, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who, we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ, Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. And so it's not that. It's not, it's not about continuing in sin. Or, or, or maybe another question will be, does being free in Christ mean that we are free to live our lives pursuing our own hopes and our own dreams? Right? That's what it's about. That He has set us free to, to live the way we want because we know uh, that, that God's number one concern is our happiness, right? Right? No. His number one concern is not our happiness. His number one concern is our holiness, Right? And, and, and Paul, again, would, would deal with this same uh, wrong way of, of thinking in Ephesians 2. Ephesians 2, 2, 10 says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Right? So the, 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 the freedom that Christ brings for you and I, the, the freedom that Christ has made possible for us is that we are free from the power and the penalty of sin and we are also have the freedom of, from works-based righteousness, right? From, we, we are free from that, free from those, the, the, the bondage of, of trying to perform and, and, and do things to make God uh, uh, like us, to, to make God uh, please with us. All these things, we've been set free from all these things. Uh, uh, as a freedom from trying to earn something that we cannot earn. Uh, but the, you know, the, the apostate Judaism that Jesus was dealing with it was all about that. It was all about man-centered uh, rules and, and works and rituals. It was nothing but cold, dead religion. Cold, dead religion. Y'all know what I'm talking about? We can do the same thing sometimes. That, 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 that the things that we do here, we just go through the motions and we'll come in and we'll, we'll sit and we'll sing and we'll take our offerings and we'll go to Sunday school and we'll do discipleship and then we go home totally unchanged, just like robots. Right? That's kind of what happened here. That's what was going on with, with this, uh, the, the people of, of his day, the Jewish, the Pharisees. They just were just locked into doing these things, this cold, dead religion. You see, Jesus came to set the captives free, what the Bible tells us. He came to set the captives free. That, that included freeing people from the needless and burdensome rules and rituals of the scribes and the Pharisees. So let's take a look at our passage this morning. If you have your Bible, go ahead and grab it and stand as we honor the reading of God's Word together. If you don't have one, look, look on with your neighbor. I'm sure they won't mind. Mark chapter 2, verses 23 to 28. It says, One Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields, and as his disciples walked along, they began to pick some heads of grain. The Pharisees said to him, Look, why are they doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? And he answered, Have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry and in need? In the days of uh, Abiathar the high priest, he entered the house of God and ate the consecrated bread, which is lawful only for priests to eat, and he also gave some to his companions. Then he said to them, The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Father, we thank you so much for this day that you've allowed us to, the, the, the privilege of being assembled together here in this place to, to be instructed by your word and to, to worship you. And so, Father, I pray that we can find ourselves in the midst of this text and, 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 and examine our hearts. Are there, are there any way, wicked ways in us that things that are displeasing to you? Are, are we... Uh, imposing our wills on people? Are we, are we making Christianity something that it's not supposed to be? God, do a work in us today. God, help us to understand that, that you have sought us out to have a relationship. Christianity is about a relationship with Christ. It's not about works. It's not about doing things. So God, help us to, to get that down deep inside today. We love you and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. So, has anybody in here ever been accused of having tunnel vision? 
Y'all know what I'm talking about? When I say tunnel vision, that, that, that we, we just kind of get locked in on, on one thing. and we can't, we can't see anything else going on. We're just kind of just... And look, it's not always a bad thing, right? Sometimes tunnel vision's good. I, I think about uh, students. I think about, you know, like, you know, Josh and, and Caleb. And as they, they get towards the end of a, a, a quarter of school and they got lots of finals, they need to have tunnel vision, right? They, they need to be able to set everything else aside and be able to focus in on their studies and, and, and finish well, right? That, that's good. Or, or, you know, just those type of things. You need someone. Or, or I, I want, if I'm going to a, a doctor and I have some type of surgery that needs to be done, I want my doctor to have tunnel vision. Amen? I, <laughs> I don't want him thinking about anything else but about this hole he's about to put in me and, the, the, and sit, you know, what he's going to do to make me better. I want him to have tunnel vision, right? And so I, I, I think that what happens uh, in, a, in a bad way, uh, you know, sometimes the, you know, when you get this tunnel vision, uh, it can make you... Uh, you know, blind to reality sometimes, right? You know, you, you kind of, you don't see what's going on around you in, in, a, in a negative way. You're, you're kind of oblivious. You shut off. Maybe you don't realize uh, your home life is a mess. Maybe you know, as, as a husband or a wife or even as children, you don't want to deal with the things that are going on. Maybe you're having financial problems or maybe any number of things are happening. So you kind of just close off. And so that's a, a, a negative way of, of having this tunnel vision that you kind of just place yourself kind of in a, in a fantasy land. You know, it's like, you know, sometimes, uh, you, you know, especially, I guess, in, 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 our, in the day we live in, uh, people love their devices, right? We all do. We, we all love our, our tablets or our iPads or our, our, our iPhones or smartphones, whatever. And if you, if you go to the mall or you go anywhere, and, and it's maybe just, just, just have a little fun. Go sit down at a bench somewhere and just people watch. Anybody else do that besides me? Leslie wants to go, and I'll just, I'm get tired, I'll go sit down. I'm just, I'll meet you outside, I'll be out there where the chairs are, and I'll sit there, and I'll watch people, and it just amazes me how many people are, are walking about. Nobody's looking where they're going. Everybody has their phones out, you know, and they're walking around like, like zombies with looking down in their phones, and it's amazing that people aren't just stumbling over each other, but in fact, some people do. I've seen some uh, videos of, of, of a... Uh, I remember one lady walking like in a mall, like in a courtyard area, and she walked right into a a a, a, a pool or, or or a fountain or whatever. You know, she was totally surprised, didn't even see it. And in some situations where you have people that walk out uh, in front of moving cars, right, not even paying attention, they're so uh, so so zoned in, they're having this tunnel vision. And you see, the scribes and the Pharisees of Jesus' day, they had this same type of bad tunnel vision, right? They were so locked in on their rules and rituals uh, that they could see nothing else. They couldn't see anything else. They had added so many extra laws and regulations to God's law that God's law was completely lost on them. They were even so focused in on their rules that they couldn't even recognize the Messiah and He was standing right in front of them, right? Can you imagine? He's right there. Jesus, the Messiah, is right before them and they couldn't even see Him. But the Pharisees quickly learned to despise Jesus and his teachings because he walked in freedom from their useless religious system. And he was teaching others to do the same thing. And so he wasn't a very popular fellow amongst them. And so our passage this morning is going to show us three benefits of being free in Christ. Three benefits. The first one, the first benefit is that we are free from works-based religion. Right? Free from works-based religion. Verses 23 to 24 it says, one Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields, and as his disciples walked along, they began to pick some heads of grain, and the Pharisees said to him, look, why are they doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? And so for the, the, the Jewish people, uh, the Sabbath was a really big deal, right? That was a, a, a really uh, big deal for them. It was given to the Israelites by Moses uh, in the Ten Commandments uh, after they had been set free from their, their captivity uh, from the Egyptians. Uh, that for us, when we think about the Sabbath day, uh, it began Friday at sundown and ended at sundown on Saturday. Uh, it was originally given as a day of rest. And you think about uh, the Sabbath day and, and, and God in creation and six days he worked and on the seventh day he rested. That's where this comes from. That's what, how God instituted this uh, very same thing. And the Sabbath was uh, something that was unique and it set uh, apart God's people as a distinct people. Uh, and, and they were to, to set that day aside and, and to cease from their work and normal activities and, and rest and to worship 
him and him alone. You see that, that, that Moses, I guess maybe if you want to say there's a problem here, uh, but there's not a problem in God's word, it's how they applied it. Moses didn't give any specifics, right? He didn't give any specific details on exactly uh, what the people were to do. So what you have is the, the, uh, the, the religious leaders decided to go ahead and, and add to it and, and determine for themselves what it meant. They, they built this of wall of laws that, that uh, giving great detail uh, as to what was allowed on the Sabbath and what was not allowed on the Sabbath to make sure that the people would not violate the Sabbath. So here you see that they're taking a good thing and starting to, 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 to turn it into a bad thing. Listen to some of these, these rules that they come up with. It says that, that people were forbidden from traveling more than 3,000 feet from their homes on the Sabbath. And of course, you know, they learned to devise some loopholes there. And I read in some commentaries that what they would do uh, you know, the, the, the dwelling place, their homes or tents or wherever they had, uh, they would, they would uh, bind ropes between uh, buildings and they would say that that became one dwelling place. And so they would uh, link buildings with ropes or, 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 or boards or whatever. You'd have a whole section of, ro- uh, of houses that would be technically one dwelling place to extend their ability to be able to move further, right? So they were still trying to <laughs> manipulate things to be able to go further, but that's still... Uh, just one silly one. Uh, another, what the, uh, a fire could not be lit or extinguished, right? And so that's pretty important. So if you if, if the Sabbath came and by chance you got distracted and and you never lit your fire or whatever, you're out of luck. You can't. You're going to sit there in the dark. You're not going to be able to, uh, you know, be warm or whatever the case is. You can't do it. You can't start a fire. You can't put one out. So if 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 maybe your fire gets out of control and you start to burn your house down, guess what? You can't put it out, right? That's work. Isn't that silly? Over and over again, you have these things. Uh, it was against the law to tie or untie a knot. Uh, to sew two, uh, you couldn't sew two stitches. You can sew one stitch, but not two. Uh, you couldn't prepare food. Uh, carrying anything heavier than a dried fig was for- forbidden, right? That'd be work. Uh, and if, if a Jew was injured or became sick on the Sabbath day, uh, it's kind of you're out of luck. It was un- unlawful to make them better. You can kind of sustain them, you know, so they wouldn't perish, but you couldn't do anything to make them better. Right, because that'd be considered a work, and so uh, that's one more. Uh, scribes uh, couldn't carry pens. Uh, tailors could not carry their needles, and, and you'd say, why? Why couldn't they do that? So they wouldn't be tempted to, to do any work, right? So they would have to set those things aside. And, and listen to this uh, for our ladies, and it's kind of—I thought this was funny. It says women were not allowed to look into mirrors since they might be tempted to pull out a gray hair if they saw one, right? If they saw one in there, they might be tempted to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, they, they wouldn't be able to do that. And, of course, they couldn't wear jewelry either because it might weigh more than a dried fig, right? And so all these things. And, of course, specific to our text, they could not sow seed, they couldn't plow a field, they couldn't reap a harvest or thresh wheat, right? And, and just, I can go on and on uh, with these things. Uh, it's just ridiculous the things that they come up with. And so Jesus and some of his disciples we know from our text were were walking through a grain field and they decided to, uh, to grab themselves a, a, a little snack along the way that they had gotten hungry. And, and I guess according to Sabbath law, from what we just talked about, they couldn't be too far away from home. They couldn't have gone too far at this point. Uh, or the Pharisees would have charged them of breaking another law, right? That they had, they had traveled too far. They had gone too far away. But, but uh, uh, that's not what we see here. Uh, what, what they would do with this grain, this was a common practice. You know, they would take the grain and they would roll it in their hands. Uh, and and it would, what it would do, it, it would remove the husk and the shell, and then they would uh, eat the kernel of grain that was left in it. And you say, this kind of sounds like stealing, right? I mean, if you're, you're walking along, and, and nowadays if you, you know, take a little detour and walk by and you start pulling some corn out of somebody's garden, that, you know, that's going to be a, an issue, right? We'd call that person a thief. But see, that's not the way it was in those days. It was, this was a provision of God himself. Uh, where it was it was common practice, especially uh, the the corners of the fields were, were left. They wouldn't harvest those. They would leave those for uh, your 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 travelers or or your uh, widows or the, the poor. They were there for that reason, and so it's this very same thing that they would do. This walk along and and, and take some grain to uh, to eat as they went. So uh, God allowed this, but see the Pharisees did not allow this in their in their man made laws. They added to so. How many times do we forbid people from doing things that God's Word does not forbid? Right? How many times do we do that? How many times do we 
tell people they can't do this or they can't do that, and, and we and we and we support it with the Bible. We say that you know Christians don't do this or God or God doesn't allow these things. How many times do we do that? And it's just simply not true. How many times do we do this? How many times do we make people do things that God's word does not command them to be done? Right? That we add all these things. You see, Baptist churches have their fair share of Pharisees too. Did y'all know that? <laughs> we do. We, we have the same thing that kind of stirs up or we find ourselves doing every, every now and then. We may not have rabbinical law, but guess what most churches do have? Bylaws. Right? Bylaws that, 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 that pretty much work the same way. You see, there's plenty of things in church bylaws that have nothing to do with how God has ordered His church, right? These are these are just things that we've added in, things that 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 we want done. We, you know, we'll think uh, we'll pick and choose uh, what we will enforce and what offends us, right? Those are the things that typically fill up church bylaws, and, and I think even in our own personal lives and how we operate as a church and individual Christians, uh, we you know we don't want to confront people over or, over serious things, the things that the Bible you know, clearly talks about. We, we don't want to address people that are living in open sin, and we just don't want to deal with that. But you know what we will do? We'll get on to somebody for drinking coffee in the sanctuary. You understand what I'm saying? You know, you can't do that. What are you doing? You can't drink coffee in the sanctuary. What's wrong with you? But we'll look the other way with many other things the Bible actually speaks to. Right? That's a Pharisee. That's what the Pharisees would do. They're worried about those type of things. You see, in last week's passage, it was... The, the, the struggle was not fasting. Not fasting was the issue. And now Jesus and his disciples were breaking Sabbath law. Things are just getting worse and worse and worse as far as the Pharisees uh, see with Jesus. And so sure the Pharisees were thinking of Jesus and his disciples were, were, were really concerned about righteousness. They would, they would do what we do. They would, they would keep the, the, the law like we do. They would do all these things, not ignore it, right? It's almost as if Jesus and his disciples were going out of their way to not do what the, what the law said, what the Pharisees were, were telling them to do. But you see, Jesus and his disciples knew something that the Pharisees did not know. Or rather, they refused to accept it, right? They knew that righteousness does not come through keeping the law. They knew that. They knew that righteousness doesn't come through keeping the law, you know, unless, there's a loophole here, that righteousness can come through the law if you can keep it perfectly. If you can keep it perfectly, it, it, it works for you. But raise your hand if you can keep the law perfectly. The law of God, the Ten Commandments, if you can keep all of them perfectly your whole life, raise your hand. That's what I thought. Nobody. It's not just us. Nobody here can do it. Nobody can do it. Nobody uh, can do that. Only Christ can do that. You see, righteousness does not come from performing good, work, good, good works, even if they're spiritual works. Righteousness only comes through repentance of sin and faith in Jesus Christ. That Jesus fulfilled the law for us. He done what we could not do for ourselves. And by faith, His righteousness is imputed to us. That means it's given to us. It's, it's given to us as a gift. That He not only came to set us free from the bondage and penalty of our sin, He also came to set us free from the bondage, or from the, 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 the bondage and burden of works-based religion. He set us free from those things. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 to, to 30 says, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You see what he's doing here? He's changing everything. He's flipping everything they believe on, their, on its head. And so, you know, what, what's the purpose of good works in a Christian's life? You know, you, know, you, you may be starting to think, well, Brother Mike, you're, you're almost like saying that it's not important that we do good things or that we uh, you know, do what the Bible says. That's not what I'm saying at all. That's absolutely not. If you're hearing that, you're hearing me wrong. That there's a, a great need, that, that we, there, uh, there's a great need for us to do good works. You see, good works validate the genuineness of our faith, right? They, they, they validate who we are, that our profession and faith is true. That's the purpose of, of good works in our lives. That, that we have truly received the grace of God. That, we, yes, we are faithful to church. We're faithful to read our Bibles. We're faithful to pray. We're faithful to give. We're faithful to serve and to share the gospel with others and a multitude of other things. But listen, here's the difference. We do those things because we've been made righteous through faith in Christ. 
not so we can make ourselves righteous. Right? That's the difference. It's because we have been saved that we're different, that we have been made new, that we have been set free. That's the purpose of those things in our lives. That James would say that faith without works is dead faith. Right? And so it's, it's a natural thing for a believer, for us to, to live in a way that's pleasing to God. And all these things that the, the, the Pharisees had made into laws, we do it because we have been changed. Right? It's, because of, it's, we've, it's part of who we are now. We do good works because we want to. Right? That's the difference. We do good works because we want to, not because we have to. That's the difference. That's the difference between somebody who's saved and somebody who's trying to work their way to God. Right? You know, why are you here this morning? Are you here this morning because you have to be here or because you want to be here? That's the question asked. Why do you read your Bible? Because you have to read your Bible or because you want to read your Bible? You understand the difference? That, that, that's what we're looking at here. That's the difference between what Jesus was teaching and what the Pharisees was teaching. Right? I would just ask you this, and I, and I know it's true for me. Aren't you glad that God doesn't forgive you and accept you based off of your good works? Right? If, if, he, if he was judging you based off of your performance, we'd all be in trouble. We'd all be in trouble. And so thank God that he doesn't. You see, man-made rules will never get you to God only Jesus can do that. Only faith in the Lord of the Sabbath will get you there. You see, when we're free in Christ, we are free from works-based religion. And I am so thankful for that. The second benefit that we are free from uh, uh, in Christ are free from the opinions of people. Free from the opinions of people. This is an important one here, another important one. In verses 25 to 26 says, He answered, Have you never read? what David did when he and his companions were hungry and in need. In the days of uh, Abiathar, the high priest, he entered the house of God and ate the consecrated bread, which is lawful only for priests to eat, and he also gave some to his companions. You see, we talked about in Sunday school in the men's class, and I'm sure probably in the ladies also, about conflict, right? The conflict that arises. And I think we can all learn from Jesus here uh, uh, when he was confronted by the Pharisees it's, it's something that it stands out to me. He didn't argue, did he? There was no argument in, in, that, that, that burst out here or, or, or began. Instead, he let the Scriptures argue for him. Right? Let us do the same thing. Let the, the Scriptures argue for us. You see, Jesus uh, dealt with the facts of the Bible, not people's opinions about the Bible. Right? Let me say it one more time and, and listen. Jesus dealt with the facts of the Bible, not people's opinions of the, about the Bible. Because sometimes that's what happens, that people just give you their, your opinions. And even uh, Brother LeVon does it for me all the time whenever he prays for me before the service. Let, let not my words be my opinions, but the, but the truth of the Word of God. Amen? That's what you want. That's what you need. That's what needs to come forth from this pulpit. That's what needs to come forth from every one of these, these Sunday school classrooms, every discipleship uh, cl- uh, a study we do. We need the facts of the Bible, not just our opinions. You see, he used the, he, uh, Jesus used the very thing that they were supposed to be the experts in to show them that their charges were not valid. That, that David had, had done something in the past far worse than this. When you think about the scale, when you're thinking about comparing, uh, you know, just taking some hands of grain and eating on those things, that's small compared to going and eating the showbread from the tabernacle. That's, that's huge. You're looking, if you want to say a, 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 a felony or misdemeanor, that, I mean, you're looking at some, some very uh, vastly different uh, charges here. And so that's what we see, that, that, uh, that David and his con- and companions uh, were on the run, that, that, that King Saul was chasing after David at this point, and, and they didn't have food with them, and they were desperate and, and cold and hungry, and, and they came to the tabernacle, and they found in, in the tabernacle uh, there were these, uh, 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 these loaves of bread. There were... Uh, 12 loaves is what it, what it says if you look at the scriptures, that every Sabbath there would be a fresh batch of bread placed on a, a, a golden table in the, in the holy place. And, and each week they'd be replaced. And so uh, when you, a new batch would come and they'd take the old ones out, uh, then those 12 loaves, the, only the priests were allowed to eat those bread, those loaves of bread. And so that's kind of where we're at uh, in what you see in this text, that the, the, the high priest saw David and, and heard uh, his plea uh, and had compassion on him and he allowed David and his friends to, to have the bread and eat it even though it was unlawful according to the law. 
And so you can just imagine what the Pharisees were thinking here when they're looking uh, at this, this story or being reminded of the story that, that, that you, know, you have two men uh, that are cherished in Judaism, or two officers. You, they, they love David, and they look at David as their example, and, and they give the high priest such praise and, and so much uh, respect. And you have these two men, uh, 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 you know, both of them uh, willfully complicit in violating Levitical law. Right? You, can you imagine what they were thinking here? They had nowhere to go as they, as they see this. You see, this was, 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 was a given by God. This was not a, a, a man-made law like the Pharisees were charging the disciples with. So why would the high priest do this? Right? You know, when you think about that, what, what was David was doing, why would he, why would he do this? Or, or, or better yet, what was God showing us through this encounter? I, and I believe this is what he's showing us. God is more concerned about compassion for people in urgent need than He is about maintaining rituals and rules. Right? That, that's what He's more concerned with. He's, he's more concerned about people and more concerned about people in urgent need than He is about maintaining rituals and ceremonies. And you know, Jesus would go on and teach the very same thing later, a, a lesson that, that He gave as a parable that, that we know as the parable of the Good Samaritan. The very same thing when they ask question about who is my neighbor, right? Who... Who do I have to be, you know, who do I have to treat well? And this is what he says in Luke 10, 30 to 37. And Jesus answered and said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves who stripped him of his clothing, uh, wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a certain priest came down that road, and when he saw him he passed by on the other side. Likewise a Levite, when, when he arrived at the place, came and looked and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had, compa- had compassion. And so he went to him and bandaged his wounds, uh, pouring, all, uh, uh, pour, pouring on all and wine, and he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And on the next day when he departed, he took out two denarii, uh, gave them to the innkeeper, and said to him, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, when I come again, I will repay you. So which of these three do you think was neighbor to him who fell among the thieves? And he said, he who showed mercy on him. And then Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. The very same thing. You see this, this, this Levite and this priest were doing the right thing according to the law, right? They were keeping themselves from being defiled from this man, right? They, they would rather keep themselves uh, uh, pure uh, according to the law and be able to go on to the temple and do their things and they left this man laying there on the side of the road. They wasn't they wouldn't willing to have compassion on him. They were more focused on keeping the rules. You see, the Pharisees were more concerned with preserving their own authority through their enforcing their own rules than caring for the needs of others. You see, Jesus' disciples had done nothing wrong according to God's law. They had done nothing wrong here according to what the Scripture said. But according to the, the opinions of the Pharisees, they had broken their law. Right? Notice I said their laws. Not, not God's law, but their laws. And so according to their opinions, they were in the wrong. And sadly, this still happens all the time in our churches, both from the pulpit and from the pews. Right? This very same thing happens all the time. You have, you have ignorant people giving their opinions as if they carry the same authority as the Bible. You'll have these red-faced preachers yelling and condemning things that people are doing that he thinks they should not be doing. He's giving their opinion, giving his opinion, not God's word. And without a doubt, there are always going to be some people out there in the pews that are going to give him a big hearty amen back, even though what he's saying is not biblical at all. Right? You see it happen all the time. You see, there's nothing more dangerous than a biblically illiterate preacher preaching to a group of biblically illiterate people. You have the blind leading the blind and saying amen to amen. See, that's the, that's the breeding ground of, for legalism and works-based religion. It's so easy for us to get hung up on how people dress, uh, where people eat, where they shop, what music they listen to, and what movies they're, they're watching. And yet again, time and time and time, we, uh, time, and time we, we fail to see that the Bible overrules our opinions. Right? The Bible overrules our opinions. You know, who, who cares what, what, what we think? Who cares what you think? You see, you don't need me preaching my opinions. And let me add one more thing to that. 
Don't be expecting me to preach your opinions either. Right? Don't, don't, don't be uh, expecting me to preach your opinions and I won't be giving you mine either. And I, and I know, right, and I've had discussions with, with many of y'all, that, that some of you probably don't like the way I preach. Right? I, I get that. You know, I, I, that you, just, you don't care for it. Uh, or, or, or how I work through a book verse by verse, uh, taking my time to be sure and explain the Scriptures as clearly as I can uh, with the Spirit's help. That the way I prepare my sermons and, and the way I have my notes and these things, you know why I do that? To guard myself from giving you my opinion. That's why. That's why I stick to my notes. That's why I do the things that I do. You see, you may not realize it, but preaching your opinion is easy. It really is. I wouldn't have to prepare at all. All I got to do is pick something that's bothering me that week or one of my pet sins and come here and stand up here and maybe walk around and up and down the aisles and yell and everything else. And then some of y'all will be, amen, brother. You know why? Because you, you don't commit that sin. They do that. That's not something that, 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 that bothers you or doesn't affect you. So you'd be just amen and me right along. But listen to me. Faithfully preaching the Word of God, sticking to the text is, is difficult. It's difficult. It's, it's hard work and it takes commitment. And so let me just say this and give you just a little bit of encouragement here. Don't let a bunch of religious dum-dums make you stumble in your faith with their opinions about God and about the Bible and what it means to be a Christian. Don't let them do it. Don't let them rob your joy. You see, we don't fight ignorance with ignorance. We fight ignorance with facts. Right? We don't fight ignorance with ignorance. We fight ignorance with facts, with the truth of God's Word. That's what we see Jesus doing in this verse, and this is what we see Jesus doing over and over again throughout the four Gospels. You see, when you're free in Christ, you are free from the opinions of people. That's a blessing, a huge, huge blessing. And lastly, we see that we are free to choose. Free to choose, right? Verses 27 to 28 says, Then he said to them, The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. And so surely at this point, Jesus uh, you know, had dropped the truth bomb about David and the consecrated bread and the Pharisees were, were left speechless and staggered, right? At this point, they... I can just imagine their faces. What could they say? You know, they had no defense for this. They had nowhere to go from here. That their whole religious system was being shown for what it was. It was worthless. And there was nothing that they could do about it. And, and even they could not argue with the Scriptures, right? They, there's nothing they could say that, that, that Jesus showed them the Scriptures and referred to the Word of God themselves. There's nothing, you know, if you're going to argue with the Bible, you're arguing with God, right? And that's often what I tell people, that they get upset with me and mad at me and and the things that I preach, and the things that I teach. And I said, your problem is not with me. If, if I'm preaching my opinions or giving my opinion, then yes, your problem is with me. But if I'm preaching the Word of God and teaching the Word of God, your problem is not with me, your problem is with God. Right? That's the truth. That's the reality. That's what we see here, that even the Pharisees could not say anything to deny what Jesus was telling them because it was from the Word of God itself. You see, and as if what Jesus had already said wasn't damaging enough he, he he completely turns the, uh, the purpose of the sabbath upside down on them he says this that the sabbath was made for man not man for the sabbath right that they had, they had turned this thing around it was supposed to be a day of rest it was supposed to be a day of peace it was supposed to be a day free from the stress of work and, and just trying to provide for yourself or your family run one writer would say this about the sabbath he said god designed the sabbath to be a mer- a merciful day of spiritual reflection and physical recuperation for the people that's the purpose of the Sabbath. that's what god intended to be but it was the pharisees and their burdensome laws that were in violation of the sabbath it wasn't jesus disciples they're the ones who had made this thing something that it wasn't supposed to be that all the restrictions that they had placed on the people had completely obscured the whole purpose of the sabbath in the first place and as I said, when we first began, when I think about uh, the, the Christmas holidays, that the, the, the Jews had, had turned something good into something bad, that something that should have produced rest into something that produced stress. And Jesus delivered the final blow when once again He proclaimed His divinity by using the messianic, the messianic title, Son of Man. They knew exactly what He was saying. When He said that, when, every time He used that word, they knew exactly what He was saying. He was saying that I am God. 
that I am the Lord of the Sabbath. It's not them. You don't control anything. You don't decide anything. You don't, you don't have the authority to, to make these type of decisions. Only the Lord of the Sabbath does. Jesus has that authority. So, for us, uh, how, how does the Sabbath apply to us as New Testament Christians? Right? That's the question for us today, right? Or, 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 or does it apply to us at all? Right? How, how do we take something from this text? Is the, the, the Sabbath. Well, let me just start by saying this. If we're going to say that we're going to use the, the Bible as our, as our rule and our standard, then I must, be, must tell you that uh, you will not find anywhere in the New Testament where Christians are, are made to observe the Sabbath. Anywhere. You won't find any proof of that anywhere. However, right, there's always a but, isn't it? However, the pattern that we see established by the early church fathers was that the first day of the week, or we say Sunday, was set aside to gather and worship Jesus, right? Very similar to what the Jews would do on the Sabbath day. So it's a wise and it's a spiritually healthy thing for, for all of us to set aside a day to rest and worship Jesus with our forever family. But listen to me. It's not commanded by God. You hear me? It's not commanded. It's not, it's, this is not a rule. This is not, this is not something we have to do. This is something that we should want to do. That's the difference. You understand what I'm saying? We should have a desire to be here. We should have a desire to gather with the church. You see, the closest thing that we have to a command uh, 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 is found in Hebrews 10. Hebrews 10, 23 to 25. It says, Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promises is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. You see, as Christians, we don't have to come to church to be secure in our salvation. Right? We don't. We don't have to do that. But we should want to come to church as often as we can because of our salvation. Right? Do you see the difference? Right? Again, it's, it's a response to what, what God has already done in our lives. We should want to be here. Uh, spiritually speaking, uh, every day is a Sabbath for a believer because we have ceased from our spiritual labor and now rest in the certainty of our salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. If you want to think of it that way, I think that's a great, great statement. So, what are we supposed to do on Sundays? Right? What are we supposed to do? This is going to surprise you, and some of you won't like it. You know, you know what you're supposed to do on Sundays? It's up to you. <laughs> it's up to you. Biblically, it's up to you. It's up to you what you do on Sundays. The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Biblically, there is plenty of support that we should make every effort to be in church on the Lord's Day uh, when that is possible. But beyond that, what you do with the rest of your time on Sunday, that's up to you. That's up to you. Because you, all the time you hear people, you know, you ain't supposed to do this, don't do that. You got somebody cutting the grass, somebody, you know, I don't, we don't eat. We don't, we don't, uh, we don't go out and, and, and eat out. We don't want to make somebody work on the Sabbath, right? We don't want to make somebody else cook on the Sabbath and all these things that we say. Right, but that's it's not biblical. Right, you, you you get to choose what you do. If you want to work, then work. If you need to go shopping, go shopping. You need to cut your grass, cut your grass. And if you're still not sure what you should be doing, if you're still not comfortable with my answers, what I just gave you, let me offer you this: pray about it. Pray about it. Ask the Lord what He would have you to do on the Lord's day, on a Sunday. What what does He want you to do? Pray about it and ask Him to give you. Uh, wisdom and discernment there you see brothers and sisters we're not under law we have been set free right we have been set free if you trusted christ we have been set free and when you're free in christ we are free to choose but let me ask add just one more little caveat to this whole thing right that we are free to choose but our choices have consequences (laughs) <laughs> they have consequences. And so related to, to, to how we uh, commit ourselves to the church and, and the, the disciplines of, the, of, the, uh, of spiritual variety that we uh, come to church, read our Bibles, pray, all those things, there are consequences, the choices that we make. And those consequences are typically bad when we choose to miss church on a regular basis. They're typically bad when we, we neglect to read our Bibles. They're typically bad when we neglect prayer. Amen? And so I'm not saying you have to do anything, but I would encourage you to do so because that's what the Bible also shows us. 
So as we close our time this morning, I will just remind you that the Sabbath was a gift to God's people. That's what He gave it for. It was supposed to be something good that misguided religious people made into something bad. Instead of being able to rest and worship, people were stressed out because they were worried about doing something to violate the Sabbath and bringing judgment on themselves. And so for us, the, the, those of you, my brothers and sisters in Christ here this morning, as New Testament believers, we worship Jesus, and He is the Lord of the Sabbath, right? That's, that's who we are. That's, that's the one that we worship. We worship Him. We're not under bondage to any religious system. We're under grace. Right? We're under grace, that we're not a performance-based people, that, that we are, are, are covered by the blood of Christ, and His grace is sufficient for each one of us, that we have been set free by the blood of Christ at Calvary, that we are free from works-based religion. Right? It's not about how good you are. It's about who, how good God is for us. It's about how good Jesus was in our place. That's what it's all about, that, that, that we are, are free from the opinions of people. Right? We let the, the Word of God shape our lives, that, 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 that uh, not people's opinions. And, 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 of course, to be able to do that, you know what? I always say it. We need to know our Bibles. Right? If we don't know our Bibles, we're going we're gonna to be shaped and tossed back and forth by people, spiritual-sounding people that, that talk like they have authority, but they speak out of ignorance. And so for us to be protected from those type of things and, and people's opinions that are, that are flawed or, or leading us astray, we must know the truth of God's Word. And also, we are free to choose. But choose what you do wisely. Choose what you do, you, you do wisely. Choose what you do prayerfully. And for our unbelieving guest here this morning, let me ask you this question. Would you like to be set free today? Right? I mean, that's the question of the, of the day for those who have not trusted Christ. Would you like to be set free today? You see, you may not know it, but that's the reason why you're here this morning. Right? You may think you just showed up here because somebody invited you or, or, or somebody's been pestering you to come or maybe it's close to Christmas, so the right thing to do is to come to church around Christmas time because that's what good people do, right? Maybe that's why you think you're here, but, but God had you here for this. That, that, that even in your heart of hearts, you know that something's not right in your life. You know that. You know that something is missing. Something is not quite the way it should be. You know what that is? That's the grace of God drawing you in. That's the grace of God drawing you to Himself. That you have been a slave to sin your whole life. You've been a slave to sin and death long enough. And it's time for you to experience true freedom. Freedom that only comes through faith in Jesus Christ. So the next question will be how. right? How do I do this? How can I have this freedom? Now I'm not going to give you on my opinion. I've already talked about that enough. I'm going to tell you what the Word of God says. Right? This isn't what Brother Mike thinks. This is what the Bible teaches us. Romans 10, 9 and 10. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes under righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So, two more questions and then we'll be through. Are you ready to confess Jesus as your Lord? Right? Are you ready to do that? Are you ready to confess Jesus as your Lord? Question number two, are you ready to believe in your heart that God has raised Him from the dead? Two questions. If you can say yes to both of those questions, you're ready to be saved today. You're ready to be set free. So I'm not sure how God's dealing with you this morning. What's on your heart? Right? Why you're here, I'm not sure. God can, only God knows that and you know that. So if you're ready to, to be set free, if you're ready to be set free from the penalty of sin, to, to, to be reconciled back to God, today's the day to do that. As we have a time of invitation in just a moment, we're going we're gonna to all stand and we're all going to sing a, 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 a few a courses of a, of a hymn. And I want you to do some business with God. Whatever He's leading you to do, if, you, if, if today is the day of salvation for you, you bow your head and, and you just say a simple prayer. It's not complicated. You, you confess that you're a sinner, confess your faith and say, yes, I believe Everything that that preacher is saying, I believe that Jesus is the only way to be saved and, and ask Him to save you, and He will do it. It's just that simple. And then there's a, a next step to that. I need you to come forward. I need you to come down and, and, and tell me, not just tell me, but tell the church that you have decided today is your Independence Day. T today you have chosen to be set free from the penalty of your sin and announce it. Make it public. Confess your 
your uh, decision to follow Christ today. All right? And for some of y'all, there might be just a need for prayer. If you need me to pray with you, I'd love to do that. I'd, I'd love to pray with you. If you want somebody else to pray with you, grab a hand, right, and share them what's going on in your heart and have them pray with you. Uh, whatever the Lord is leading you to do today, please don't leave here without taking care of it. Amen? All right. Let's pray, and we'll have a time to respond. God, we do thank you uh, so much for your love towards us. Father, we thank you for uh, the ability to be, to be made free. Thank you for the clarity of your word that that freedom only comes through faith in Jesus Christ. No other way. That we can't earn our way. We can't be good enough. We can't do enough uh, uh, spiritual things. We can't come to church enough. We can't read our Bible enough. Uh, we can't give enough money. None of those things are sufficient to get us back to where we need to be with God. So, Father, I pray that you would just uh, just bless the, the preaching of your word today, Lord. If there be any here in our midst today that has not yet been set free from the, the bondage and penalty of their sin, God, I pray that today will be the day of salvation. Give them the courage to, to do that. Give them the courage to, to turn from their sin and turn to Christ. And, Father, for your church, for your people, God, we are susceptible for, to doing the same things that the Pharisees do, that we, we are so easily uh, uh, twisted and turned, and, 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 and we want to impose our opinions and, 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 and our preferences and, and, and place them on people as burdens as though they are things that, that, that we must do to be right with you. God, forgive us. Forgive us of those things. Lord, reveal to, to us those things that we do that are displeasing to you, that we would repent. God, thank you so much for this day. We give you thanks for what you're going to do as we close, and we're going to give you thanks for what you're going to do this afternoon and the coming week. God, thank you so much for the Christmas season and what it means that heaven has indeed come down, that, that God has, has, has indeed dwelt among us to redeem us, to draw us back to himself, to be reconciled back to the King of glory. God, thank you for loving us in that way. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.